This is your guide for using the completely free and open source CAM CNC software, Kirimoto. It's a great solution for budget AliExpress CNCs all the way up to premium desktop CNC routers. Recently, I've donated some CNC routers to schools as well as friends. So the aim of this video is to help them and anyone else getting started to hit the ground running, experience some success without spending a cent. By the end of this video, you should have a complete workflow that you can follow through for simple projects. So let's get started. I think we should start by explaining quickly what CAM is. It stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. And in simple terms, it's software to convert 2D or 3D geometry to toolpaths for CNC manufacture. We use a version of CAM all the time when we 3D print. When we take a 3D model like an SDL or STEP and use our slicer to convert it into the individual movements and extrusions that form our 3D print. Laser cutting and engraving also uses CAM software, as does CNC machining, which is the focus of this video. With 3D printing, our toolpaths add material, but for CAM, we're removing it. But apart from this distinction, it's essentially the same. We're creating toolpaths, the CNC router can understand, and execute to manufacture the object. One popular option for CNC CAM is Fusion 360. And beyond that, I actually have paid licenses for some CAM programs like MeshCAM, as well as Desproto, and they're both useful. But what I find myself coming back to over and over is Kirimoto. It's browser-based, completely free and open source. Those other CAM options also have free tiers, but Kirimoto is truly free. It doesn't even have any advertisements. And if you want, you can download the source off GitHub make modifications and run it locally. To access it for free on the browser, all we need to do is enter grid.space slash Kiri. Before you rage quit because you think this is only a cloud service, let me repeat that you can go to GitHub, download an installer and run Kiri Meadow locally and offline. With that reiterated, let's move on. When you first open Kiri Meadow, it's probably going to be in FDM 3D printing mode. So the first thing you should do is come up to the corner and select mode and we can see Kiri supports a vast range of manufacturing equipment, but in this case, we're interested in selecting CNC. Selecting this will change the workspace to suit. The next thing we'll do is to come across to setup and then select machines. Now you'll notice in the dropdown, there's actually a wide array of popular machines where the profile is pre-populated and ready to go. You can start with any of these and then modify them. I'll start with one of the generic ones and modify that to suit your machine. Let's say for instance, we were setting up a Carvera Air, but only the regular version is available. We can select that, and that will automatically put in all of the correct G-code commands for turning on and off the spindle and things like that. We can then study any changes such as the build volume, and then come up to customize in the upper right, which will unlock the fields and let us make any changes we need to suit our machine. Once we're done, we can rename this, for instance, calling this one the Carvera Air. If you are on either Carvera, I'd recommend in the footer G-code adding this M496.1 code, which will move the tool head away from the job for easy access once it's complete. With the machine set up complete, our next job is to set up our cutting bits. In Kirimoto, we once again come up to the top right hand corner, hover over setup and this time select tools. You can see I've already set up six tools, but let's set up one more as an example. We're gonna click the plus. Our first job is to give a name, and it should be something that actually makes sense to you. We then select whether it's an end mill, a ball mill, or a taper, and you can look at the preview on the right to make sure you've matched the right type. Next is the tool number, and this is only vitally important on a machine like the Carvera that has a tool changer, as the tool should be mounted in the dock in the position that matches this number. For the Carvera Air and most other CNCs, the number doesn't really matter, but I think it's nice to keep them distinct. If you're using metric, you can tick that, You'll now input all measurements in millimeters. And now it's just a matter of inputting the dimensions of the cutter. You'll know what each section is as the preview will update as you input values. When you're done, the preview should match the cutting bit. You can click save and then done. Now some global settings that you'll probably need in place for any job that you do. We're first going to come up to setup and then down to preferences and double check that we have the right units, choosing between millimeters or inches. Now over on the left hand side, we're gonna to come to limits and then consider Z through. If we were trying to cut something completely out and this was set to zero, it means that while we're cutting, the cutter would aim to come down to the exact base of the material. But if the material is slightly thicker than you thought, or perhaps the job started slightly too high, 
the cutter won't reach the whole way through the bottom of the material, and you'll end up with these flared sections that will need manual cleanup. Therefore, setting Z through to something like 0.4 will ensure that the cutter goes past the base of the material and you get a clean cut every time. Our next one, Z clearance, which here I have set to 5, dictates how much clearance the bottom of the cutter will be given when it's moving in free air over the material to go to a different location. Finally, another setting we want to tick is ease down. Although CNC cutting bits might look like drill bits, they actually function quite differently, with a drill bit being designed to cut vertically from the tip, but an end mill being designed to cut from the side horizontally. Therefore, these cutting bits aren't optimized to cut vertically like a drill bit, so ticking ease down will try and avoid vertical cuts in favor of diagonal ones. Let's see ease down in action in the preview for this internal hole cut. After the first pass is completed, we can see the tool path comes down to the second height diagonally, which avoids it being used like a drill bit and lowers the chance of the bit breaking. If you want, you can also change the ease angle, but 10 degrees is a pretty good baseline. It's worth noting that we're not changing everything here, and if you're curious as to what something does, you can just hover the mouse over and you should get a brief tooltip. That should be all of our global setup done, so let's move forward with some simple workflow examples. To import a file for processing, we'll come up to the corner, hover over files, select import, and then select our file. It will then appear in the center of the bed. If we need to, we can click on it and manipulate the shape with tools like rotation, scale, and mirroring. If we want multiples, we can also use duplicate. This is about the simplest job you can have to start out. We're gonna cut out this gear the whole way through for both the internal bore as well as the outline. Before we continue, we need to plan ahead for how we're going to mount our stock in the machine. In any case, you'll be using a series of clamps to hold it in position so it doesn't move around. But remember, we will be cutting through past the base of our material. So to prevent damage to the bed of our CNC, we want to position some sacrificial material underneath the stock. This plywood is a little bit cumbersome. Instead, I would recommend some cheap 3mm thick MDF as follows. Cut the MDF to roughly the same size as the stock, and then put some blue painter's tape on the top surface. After this, a thin coating of cheap super glue. On the underside of stock, we have a matching surface of blue painter's tape, and when we position the two together, the two bits of tape will be bonded. This combo is then clamped down as usual. What we're trying to avoid here is the job separating from the stock when its perimeter is completely cut. What you should find is that the tape is plenty strong to stop pieces from coming loose, but still peels off cleanly and easily, leaving a perfect part at the end. The alternative to this is to add these tabs to prevent the part from coming loose. But I'm not a fan of this because they need to be manually cut off later, and when you do, you'll probably leave a blemish behind. But if you are using tabs, now's the time to apply them in the upper left. I'd recommend making them thin, clicking the plus and using the preview to manually add them. Spinning the camera will assist with this greatly. For any tabs you have in place, Kirimoto will make sure the cutter avoids them so they're left behind. Now we're up to the exciting bit, adding operations or tool paths, and we'll do this over on the right hand side by hovering over plus. We have quite a few options here, and hovering over each of them will give you a brief description as to what they do. For this video, we'll stick to the most common ones, and the first of those is outline. As the name suggests, the outline operation will cut the entire way around the perimeter of an object to separate it from the stock material. We can see it's been added to the list, and when we hover over it, we have some parameters. The first is picking which of our tools that we're going to use for this toolpath. The next four sections, spindle RPM, feed rate, plunge rate, and step down, can only be determined through trial and error and experience. If you Google feeds and speeds for hobby CNCs, you'll probably find some different values to suit different materials, or in the case of this Carvera Air, there's some conservative starting points in the user manual. As for the other settings, I would say which ones you select depend on the job, and the best thing you can do is come up to the top left and click slice. This will give you a preview of the toolpath, and now you can play with the settings to see what each of them does. For instance, if I tick emit through, we can see this central hole has now been ignored. It's worth noting that you can add more of one operation of the same type. For instance here, my first outline operation does the inside of the part only, and then my second does the outside of the part only. This will ensure that the bore is cut first, before the external perimeter is cut to finish the job. For our next example, I've changed the geometry to have a pocket on top that doesn't go the whole way through. And to machine that, we'll come to the plus and then select pocket. Typically, we'll do our pockets before our outline, so we can drag this to the top, Along with selecting the tool, the top parameters are very similar to what we saw in outline, 
And before we look at anything else, we need to click the plus and then click the surface for the pocket we want to create. Let's slice and see what that does. Now down the bottom here, we can turn off our outline to see the pocket in isolation. And we can see that the cutter will work down gradually to remove this section. So what about if we had something curvy and we want to contour the top? For that, we're going to come to the plus and you guessed it, we're going to select contour. Normally this type of job would be best done with a bold nose cutter where we have a radius on the end instead of flat like an end mill. With the basic settings, we can see that this toolpath will zigzag over the top following the contours and leaving the desired shape behind. If you like, you can add a second contour pass, setting one to X and the other one to Y. This should add detail by doing X followed by doing Y. We would then normally add an outline to cut the entire shape out after the surfacing was finished. A contour operation is the ideal strategy for forming these detailed reliefs, which is probably best done with a very narrow and angled engraving bit. If you're carving one of these that's not quite so intricate, a narrow diameter ball nose cutter will do. One more setting for contour to achieve more detail at the expense of machining time, lower the step over value to be closer to zero. Here I've imported a simple F1 car for our last example. But if we just add a contour by itself, we'll see that the cutter needs to go almost the entire thickness of the material, which greatly increases the chances of it snapping. So to complement, we're going to come to the plus and add a rough pass. As the name implies, a roughing pass is a way to quickly and roughly remove excess material. And there's a new important setting here called leaf stock and leaf stock Z, sometimes known as skin. Let's have a look at a real world example with an F1 in schools car. What you're seeing now is the roughing pass. It's quickly removing material with quite a large step down value. Because it's being so aggressive, the surface finish for these parts will not be very good, but that's fine. Because we've left some extra stock above the final face we're aiming for. We then finish the surface with our contour pass, removing this little bit of skin, and due to the shallow depth of cut and small step over value, we get a much nicer surface finish. To make things clear, I've set both the leaf stock values to one millimeter. We can see the roughing is working its way down to remove all the excess material, but there's a clear gap above the final model. And then when we turn on the contour path, we can see it's on the surface of the model, which should give us the good surface finish. Clearly there's more operations, but the ones we've just covered should get you through the majority of jobs. Let's finish off with exporting and one of the most powerful features. So far, we've used arrange and then slice to preview the toolpaths. This has the advantage that you can toggle the various operations on and off to see them in isolation but we can see different information by then clicking preview. This shows more of the final G-code path, including travel moves between operations, and we can also see our diagonal easing down moves. In case you hadn't noticed, across the bottom of either of these previews, we have a slider where we can go through and see the order of the operations. This is great, but the real star is being able to animate the job. Down the bottom, we have a play button, and when we click it, we can see we start to simulate the cutting job. You can of course speed it up to two times, four times, eight times, or as fast as your computer will allow. This is an extremely powerful tool and will let you double check that the operations you've selected are going to give you the output that you're expecting. You might notice here some bits that don't seem very accurate and they're a little bit voxelized. We can come up to setup and then preferences and increase the resolution of the animation by making the value higher. If we click on animate again, we can see it now takes longer to build the animation but now after running the animation, we can zoom in and see those edges are a lot more refined and hopefully accurate. If everything looks good, then you should be ready to export. But there's still one more thing to double check and that's the origin. The origin is where the cutter will be positioned before the job is started. On the left hand side, if we scroll down, we have control for this. It's usually on top of the stock and by default, Kerry will position it in the lower left unless we tick origin center, where we can see the origin moves to the center of the object. By unticking this and playing with the offsets, you should have control to put it wherever you wish. The most important thing, however, is that you just remember where it is for when you're setting up the job on the router. Assuming you're happy with everything, you can finally come up to export. This will generate the G-code, give you the chance to input a file name. It will also tell you how big the file is, how long it's expected to take, and if we're happy, we can click download. Just for the sake of this video being complete, I then set up this job on the Carbera cutting it out of 3mm aluminium, and the end result matched what I was expecting from Kirimoto. One more thing, if you've got a collection of operations and settings that are ideal and you think you want to use them again, you can come up to setup and then select profiles. Give your settings a name and click save. These are like 3D printer slicer settings, you can have as many as you want, and then click to select them in future. 
You can also download them if you want to share them with someone else. Oh, and if you want to export the entire workplace, including the model and settings, kind of like a 3MF and 3D printing, we can come up to files and then select export. We give it a name and then click OK to download. That should be enough to get you started. And if you do want to learn more, Kirimoto has links to a forum, a Discord server, YouTube channel, and more. I've been using Kirimoto for many years now, and it just keeps on improving and improving. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Stuart, the creator, for making Kirimoto so capable and making it free in every sense of the word. Thank you as well so much for watching, and until next time, happy CNC routing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.